So if you cross the border unlawfully, even a first offense, then we're going to prosecute you. Those cases are up about double uh, last year, and they, we're going to go higher this year. Uh, you, it's a, a, an offense to enter the country unlawfully. If you smuggle an illegal alien across the border, then we'll prosecute you for smuggling. If you're smuggling a child, then we're going to prosecute you. And that child will be separated from you, probably, as required by law. Uh, if you don't want your child to be separated, then don't bring them across the border illegally. It's not our fault. On Sunday, United States Senator Jeff Merkley, who saw there, went to an immigrant detention center in an old Walmart that's been decommissioned in Brownsville, Texas, to try to understand why the Trump administration is ripping immigrant children from their parents at the border. And here is what happened. Yes, hello there. Yes, this is U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. And I, I'm, I'm here at the uh, Casa de Padres uh, facility for the children. I called, my team called last week to arrange for me to be able to come and visit this facility. Can you please give me a tour of it? A tour? Can I talk to the supervisor yeah, who is here? Because maybe they can explain to me. Well, maybe, that yes, would be well, you can get in contact. I can give you a uh, where and give you the number, but you guys can I don't document. really want the, the number because we call us. We don't want to actually talk to supervisors. There's no, here, right say. now, there's, if, if there's no information you guys want to come what, to. Whatever individual's in charge would be great to come and, and share and, and talk with me. Well, I was seeking to get into three different uh, places. Uh, one is a processing center run by DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, and I was given permission to do that. The second was a respite center run by the Catholic Church, and I received permission for that. This third place is after DHS hands the children over to the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's run by the Office of Ref Refugee Relocation. Uh, and so this was, technically we reached out to that office to get into this facility, and they said no. And that facility, that is the, the, the blacked out windows. That's, a, that's an old Walmart with blacked out windows that has children, uh, both who come unaccompanied and also children who've been taken away from their parents who are then housed in that facility. Is that correct? That's my understanding. I wasn't able to get precise answers, but those who work with refugees there said that is the case, that there are roughly 1,000 children inside behind those doors and without adults. I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that solidarity is a bad thing as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism um that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity actually and when you go back you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements the the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like you know grassroots neighborhood organizations a lot of these were sponsored by the church what does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. And I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. Uh, what you just heard in the beginning here was uh, a couple of clips, one from Jeff Sessions about a zero tolerance policy about immigration and children, and the other was a viral video from Congressman Jeff Merkley, who was visiting one of the detention centers for children in Texas. So as you've undoubtedly heard in the last couple of weeks, uh, a number of sort of troubling stories surrounding these issues have bubbled up again in the news cycle the undocumented people subject uh, to the immigration policies of the U.S. and, like, the brutalization by ICE that keeps coming out in the news, um, they've been forcibly sort of separated from their children. Uh, so awaiting a legal process, these kids have been, like, incarcerated in these makeshift detention centers along the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Um, and I guess like especially kind of horrifying and gross is the center that Congressman Merkley was reporting from uh, was based in an abandoned Walmart. So uh, if you look at the video, it's like um, the sliding glass doors are there and everything, but they're all like blacked out. Uh, and it's just sort of like a big empty Walmart parking lot. Right. Uh, it's also the case, too, uh, we should add that these detention centers and like these types of things aren't exactly new. Um, there's another news report that came out that like uh, a handful of like viral images that were related to them uh, happened under the Obama administration. And that's true. And we should be mad about that. <laughs> but it also is uh, especially gross because the current administration is just doubling down on those policies. In response to these tragedies, there have been mostly just been like upset in social media and a general feeling of like anger and hopelessness. I don't know what you all have seen, but a lot of people just kind of like mad about it in a sort of general way. You know, you can do things like call your representative or tweet about it. Uh, but both seem to do about the same amount of good. Um, nothing seems to be changing too fast about a bunch of uh, children locked up. In one like particularly provoking tweet, however, uh, one journalist uh, named David Swanson uh, says this. There are white Christians who are okay with forcibly separating migrant children from their families, who are also enthusiastically preparing for summer mission trips to these same children's countries. The levels of cognitive dissonance and hypocrisy are just astounding. So again, this is like one of those like uh, like kind of hopeless tweets, but I think it gets at something that's kind of interesting. Um, like the cops that are barring Merkley from entering the detention center in the clip from above, uh, Jeff Sessions and even Donald Trump all perform like a type of Christianity that does not find a conflict in practicing a white supremacy that can't even muster enough empathy for the children of undocumented people. Yeah, so <laughs> Matt and I were talking a little bit before recording this, and even though we don't know, obviously, what the kind of religious identities of all these people uh, is, it's probable that most of them are Christians, most likely. Uh, the cops are probably Christians. The Congressman Merkley is like probably a Christian. The uh, people who are guarding these children are probably Christians. And there's something really sort of especially troubling about that if you are a Christian yourself, or at least there should be something really troubling about that. Uh, like, why is it that Christianity is not just a force that seems kind of impotent in the face of, like, literally putting a bunch of kids in an abandoned Walmart, um, but also is something that is complicit in it, like Christians are doing it as Christians. Um, and not to mention the whole sort of issue about most white Christians, especially in the U.S., uh, support Donald Trump even increasingly, uh, like his approval ratings going up. So we saw these stories coming out in the news uh, after last week's episode that we did on Gerard Wynn Stanley. And we plan to do sort of a follow up on that episode by talking about Thomas Munzer, who's a German revolutionary Christian from kind of a, you know, this early reformational period. Uh and it sort of turned out that these events were actually a sort of natural setting to be thinking about radical Christian revolutionaries, especially one like Munzer, who was murdered by the state for standing up to it, especially murdered by Christian princes for standing up to them. So instead of doing just another history lesson, we thought that maybe we'd try to connect some of what Munzer was doing with our own historical moment. So kind of like, I guess, an experimental um, thing to be doing on our podcast, but uh I don't know, just really, really pulling in this history of radical Christianity that we talk about a lot on the podcast with some current events, and uh, we'll just kind of see what shakes out, I guess. So we read a couple of things. One was a, um, a Verso Books collection of some writings by Munzer, which is actually really a good, a good book. Uh, it in includes a lot of really neat sort of extra framing stuff that, that's really helpful and uh, some confessions that Munzer did. And we'll try to kind of go through those writings and some of his stuff and um, maybe make some observations along the way. So before we do, um, Matt, I guess, can I just ask you to give us a little bit of like a um, uh, a, a view of Munzer's Germany at like 10,000 feet or something? Okay, from 10,000 feet, um, here's, I guess, a little bit uh, about what's going on. So during this time that Munzer's writing is uh, what's called the German Peasants' War or the Great Peasants' War, or the Great Peasants' Revolt. Those are all the three names that Wikipedia gives it. I don't know. They all sound <laughs> good to me. Um, this revolt was particularly big. Um, uh, who knows, I guess, what really spurs revolts on, but we can say that there was sort of like a revolutionary moment in the imagination of people, uh, especially in like continental Europe at the moment, uh, coming off of the Reformation and Luther. There might have been some kind of like idea, and that's definitely where Munzer kind of comes in to the situation for sure. 
Uh, but the revolt itself was kind of a big deal. Um, between like 100,000 and 300,000 uh, armed peasants uh, were slaughtered by the aristocrats of continental Europe. It was a whole big bloody mess. It was actually the uh, biggest popular uprising in Europe before the French Revolution. Um, this is kind of in the period around like 1525 is, I guess, the height of the fighting. Um, so that's the sort of time period that's happening. Luther's in the background. Um, there is large social unrest, and Munzer is kind of capitalizing on this, uh, making and preaching a theology to the peasants that like really um, definitely does not calm them down any. <laughs> Uh, uh, all of the historians that I think we read kind of in preparation for this were really keen to note that like, um, Munzer wasn't like a social radical and then, and then made his theology afterwards. It kind of was the other way around that the, uh, the theology of Munzer, um, was like what supported the revolt. So it's like that, um, the, the Christian imagination, um, in the, the peasants that were revolting and the sort of rhetoric that Munzer used, um, alongside a handful of theological doctrines that were um, kind of new and cool because of the Reformation. All of these things helped like really urge um, the peasants to revolt and rebel against the, uh, the dukes and duchesses and aristocrats of uh, continental Europe. So pretty crazy situation. Yeah, it is super crazy. Uh, we should also note that Munzer has been picked up by loads of kind of revolutionary especially marxist theorists uh historically so Engels wrote a pretty famous book on the peasants war um that you can read all over the internet but he famously um contrasts luther and munzer in that book uh where luther ends up siding with the princes and munzer sides with the uh peasants and in fact uh, munzer does not have a lot of nice things to say about luther and vice versa so that's a really interesting uh, kind of moment one clarifying point uh like luther doesn't just side with the princes he like sides with the princes and then like also says that the masses the peasants should be like put down like dogs he is yeah, not uh, a right. <laughs> not a friendly person to the old peasants yeah he's a bad person <laughs> um sorry uh, and I'm, I'm not just saying that because i'm catholic uh because uh the catholics weren't doing so great at that point either um so ernst block uh also really famous german guy critical theory guy um he wrote an entire book about munzer about him being a, a revolutionary theologian um and there's all kinds of ways in which munzer gets picked up by the left uh the one of the prefaces in the verso book um it's by a collective of writers called wu ming and uh, they actually have a, a really amazing preface where they talk about being in Chiapas uh, and being among the, the Zapatistas in the 90s and being so moved by it and then deciding to write their own book about a peasant uprising. And they chose to write a, a novelization of the German Peasants Revolt uh, with where Munzer features really prominently. So um, they do a actually a really great job kind of tying Munzer into uh, more contemporary struggles. Um, but I guess like, uh, what really got us excited, um, or at least felt like, a an important thing for us to kind of, um, pay attention to as we're reading the stuff was the, the critical preaching that Munzer was doing. So there's one specific sermon in this book, uh, that's just called the sermon to the princes. And it, that's literally what it is. Like he gave the sermon in front of a bunch of aristocrats and, Throughout it, there's just a lot of really bold indictments of the very people that he's standing in front of, uh, and also the people whose power would eventually have him killed. Uh, so that kind of bravery, I think, is just something for Christians today to really dig into, and we're going to try to do that a little bit. In the Sermon to the Princes, too, there's kind of like a funny element of like performance. Like, when re reading this, I mean, probably wrongfully, but it is kind of like a situationist moment where he's like performing a uh, a sermon in front of people and like laying into them about how like crappy they are but like using some language where maybe they don't quite catch on or something it's like it, it's definitely <laughs> a, a really performative type of piece of writing um i think it takes a little bit of time to like pick up steam and get really good for us readers but uh it's good i promise <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right and uh just to maybe add on to that too um what's really neat about that performative bit is uh he constantly sort of appeals to the conscience of the princes yeah like he keeps sort of ironically reinforcing their authority like and, they're uh, the good the, ones right they're the good yeah princes. exactly yeah uh so if you were a really good prince then of course you would side with the peasants that's kind of the um 
the the subtext of of the sermon. Uh, and so he tries to make the princes go against all kinds of other people throughout, which is really funny. Um, but there's no uh, <laughs> there's no denying that like Munzer isn't just being like opportunist here. Like uh, I can imagine if you were a prince and you were hearing this, you would not um, you wouldn't see the joke uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't be convinced by the end. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of get into it, here's maybe one kind of rhetorical paragraph we can pull out uh, that that is a good um a good starting point. So Munzer preaches. Since the death of the beloved disciples uh, and the apostles, these scribes ha- have even reenacted the passion. They have turned the spirit of Christ into a, a laughing stock. They have most blatantly stolen him like thieves and murderers. How has this come about? My answer is that they have rejected the pure knowledge of God, and in its place they have set up a pretty fine golden image of God. Before it, the poor peasants smack their lips. Uh, so you already get this kind of resonance with Marxist theories about religion as a opiate of the masses or some kind of illusion that controls the masses. But what is different is that Munzer actually believes in God differently. Uh, so he doesn't think that, um, you know, you have to get rid of the illusion of religion or whatever, but he wants to actually go to the heart. I mean, he's a good reformer in that way, right? It's like all the Christians in Germany have, have forgotten what's really Christian and uh, I think there are all kinds of problems with that, but rhetorically, it's a very good move if you're a pastor. <laughs> and uh, he um, he just does a really kind of interesting job throughout this whole sermon, uh, driving that point home that you know the the real Christianity has been sort of abolished uh, by the the German uh, princes and priests. Yeah, uh, I think we can draw a pretty clear and easy connection to the uh, sort of contemporary situation that we were just talking about. They have turned the spirit of Christ into a laughing stock. Uh, they've turned it into something that can be used for their own ends, something that uh, subverts it, that turns it on its head, that does the exact opposite of what Christianity is supposed to do and what the spirit of Christ is all about. Um, that rhetorical move, I think, is uh, a pretty good one and, and kind of the point of most of the beginning of the Sermon to the Princes. Uh, what he keeps trying to hammer home uh, a few times is this idea that there are these people. He always calls them the scribes which is maybe problematic for some other reasons, but uh, the scribes are sort of like the placeholder for the, the people who are in power, who have done, you know, the, this bad thing with, uh, with the gospel. Um, and uh, I mean, that type of hypocrisy is uh, not far from this conversation as we've already kind of established. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that is, it's hard because like on this podcast before we've talked about how appealing to a kind of true Christianity is really dangerous because there kind of isn't one (laughs) like there are many Christianities. Um, And I think there's something really dangerous about kind of laying a claim to that in a way. Um, But at the same time, like there's something forceful and something I think that is reasonably true about saying that if you round up a bunch of kids and like put them in an abandoned Walmart, you've gone pretty far off the beaten path of what Jesus seemed to be uh, trying to get us to do. Like, that seems like a pretty uncontroversial point. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're right, like, the, the about the true Christianity thing, that that's kind of a dangerous territory. Like, sociologically, like, what you're saying, sort of, like, cultural theory-wise, is definitely true, right? People sort of uh, interpret and reinterpret tradition in all kinds of different contexts. But rhetorically it is so important to establish a true Christianity <laughs> or it's like, it's like what politics kind of relies on. Like a Christian politics, like r- rhetorically at least has to sort of like have that baseline. Um, and I, it causes problems. I, I will admit, but um, it is, it's at least a sort of, it's a constant mainstay. I think of the people that we've read in the ways that they talk about religion, maybe not exactly how they would believe it. I think in the case of Munzer, he definitely does believe that he has sort of the true Christianity because that's the, that reformational spirit for sure. It's kind of hard um, because I think that you're right. It's just that like rhetorically, this is a very good strategy. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, as troubling as like, uh, the history of Christianity or Christianities in the plural might be, um, if you are a person who goes to church or identifies as a Christian, like you do want, hopefully, to think that when you say you're following Christ, uh, you are fervently trying to do that, even if you think that there's all kinds of ways that that gets packaged, uh, um, 
and even that we we package it ourselves when we try to lay claim to that in a way that's really quite um quite dangerous uh but i do think that you know at the end there's no denying that like uh you should be able to invoke the spirit of christ to oppose things like um you know the state trying to uh forcibly remove people from their loved ones uh mm-hmm. like there's nothing wrong with saying that that's not something that christ would do and certainly not something that someone who pretends or says that they follow christ would uh be like completely okay with like signing on the dotted line which is what everybody who <laughs> supports donald trump does right like there's something actually true about that whether or not you think there's a true christianity like there's something true about saying that if you really think that jesus is a person who said a lot of things you wouldn't ever um you wouldn't ever say that he would uh subscribe to something like that well maybe we can frame it like this okay so um i mean so munster definitely thinks he's got a true christianity right like that's something yeah we can... for sure okay for sure. uh us as readers after the fact <laughs> we i mean like we know very well that there are not there's not just one Christianity, but there are like some Christianities that are pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And this is a good one, at least. The Donald <laughs> Trump one is is definitely an interpretation of a Christian tradition, like the Christian tradition of colonialism right. and conquest. Like that is a real Christian tradition, but it sucks. Right. This one at least is good. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's actually the best way of going about it. Is that uh, we should be free to sort of judge certain Christianities. Um, and not as a way of just removing them, but uh, or as a way of like finding the true one and getting rid of all the other ones, but as a way of saying that some are worth uh, perpetuating um, or like drawing into your own kind of tradition as you build it, uh, as opposed to other ones which are worth demolishing or abolishing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, um, that was a really great segue that we didn't plan on, but it was good. <laughs> uh, so no true Christianity, just good Christianity. Um, <laughs> that's our new brand, actually. Uh, yeah, very good Christianity. <laughs> I like that. Well, okay, moving along in the sermon to the princes, um, a bit more of that performative aspect comes out uh, in what follows. So uh, Munster says, therefore, uh, in light of these like counterfeit or like bad Christianities, therefore, you most true and beloved regents, um, you good princes. Learn your knowledge directly from the mouth of God and do not let yourselves be seduced by your flattering priests and restrained by false patience and indulgence. Um, So here Munster is doing that thing where he's like, well, you guys, you princes, you're listening to me. So you must be smart, right? You must not be like the dumb idiot bad guys. You're probably (laughs) the good ones. You're the smart ones. So do this thing. He goes on to describe the situation in a kind of very interesting way (laughs) that the that the princes probably didn't find as like fun and good and uh, flattering. Uh, (laughs) Munster says uh, the poor laity and the peasants see it all much more clearly than you do. If other Lords or neighbors wanted to persecute you on the account of the gospel, they would be overthrown by their own subjects. This gets at like, I think the, the sort of tension in the the dialogue or like the rhetoric here that uh, Munster's employing, like, you guys, you're so smart. You're going to listen to me. You're going to just kind of like jump on board with the whole project of the peasants war. I think if you do that um, and other people, your neighbors persecute you on the count of you, like acting on the gospel, uh, those people, they're going to be overthrown by the peasants. Those people will like, and again, like if you, if you did this, if you started persecuting people on the account of the gospel, you also would be overthrown by the the peasants. So it's this like (laughs) this, um, (laughs) <laughs> he's like a monster's kind of like a, a mobster like you know like you wouldn't want something bad to happen would you um <laughs> and uh well the only bad things happen to the peasants but anyways you get the point uh it turns out to unfortunately be an empty threat kind of like when stanley's at the end uh, that we talked about last time yeah <laughs> um but it is a rhetorically powerful one uh and one that you sort of wish was true um or couldn't imagine being true in an important way yeah uh (laughs) i think what's great too about munzer on this is um he uh he's doing this all in a sermon on the book of daniel right and um the the kind of thing that you get in um in that book is a, a story about this king who needs people to interpret his dreams for him right and none of the uh 
none of the regular interpreters are doing a very good job so he's got to go get daniel the one who can be trusted because he actually apparently has a you know direct line to god so he knows how to interpret it and i love that because munster is basically setting himself up that way that like he's the daniel to the nebuchadnezzars Mm -hmm. (laughs) of uh germany that it's like hey you guys are all dreaming about some kind of future right like you've you've heard some stuff from luther you think that maybe you could uh get out from under the thumb of the clergy um, well, I'm here to like interpret that de- that dream for you, and that dream should end with like peasants deciding what's going on. Yeah. Um. Even in the in the sermon, he goes on to say like, "What you guys need is a new Daniel." Um. I think again, that's good. It's another it's another one of those like rhetorical moves that he's uh kind of trying to pull pull a fast one here on the uh the princes, as it were, in the sense that like uh you got to listen to me. I'm the, I'm the smart guy that can like tell you what to do. See, that's what we really need, actually, is someone to go to the White House and go to Donald Trump. You'd be like, hey, listen, uh, you, you got all this, all these faith people around you, you know, they're telling you all this, all this dumb stuff, but uh, I've got the true secret. <laughs> I've got uh, the direct line. Like, you want uh, the, the best interpretation, the biggest interpretation. Uh, let me tell you, um, Kim Jong-un isn't the, uh, the worst person you're going to negotiate with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's exactly what we need. Someone, uh, <laughs> someone who could do that. So, is it Kim Kardashian? It's her, right? That's what's gonna happen. Mm. Mm. I don't know. She does have that dragon energy. Yeah, counts for something. <laughs> kind of, uh, maybe talking a little bit more about that threat that's behind um, Munzer's rhetoric here. Uh, another theme that comes through in this document is actually a pretty strong critique of nonviolence throughout, um, and uh, he is not. Um, he doesn't beat around the bush <laughs> when it comes to his affirmation of uh, the use of violence. Um, so one thing that's really fascinating is he actually wants to give the rulers a chance to recognize the uh, um, capacity that they have to uh, do it right, to use the force that they have um, in sort of the service of this uh, revolutionary vista that he's imagining. Um, so he says, now, should you want to be true rulers, then you must begin government at the roots, as Christ commanded, drive his enemies away from the elect. And the elect for him uh, still are uh, mostly like the peasants are kind of the people he has in mind, but specifically people who can kind of hear um, God's call to like share all things in common. We'll get more into that specific desire later on. Uh, but I think that's sort of a really interesting thing that he's appealing to the people with force. Uh, to kind of join that revolutionary moment. Um, that might sound like a reactionary appeal to governing authorities, uh, but I think actually, like, if you look at the history of revolutionary movements in general, like, getting the armed forces on your side is actually very important. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what Munzer is trying to do here, right? Like, he's not trying to reinscribe their authority, um, but rather to kind of invite them um, and give them maybe, like, one last chance to be on the right side of uh, this revolutionary history. Yeah um side note we'll get into it a little bit more in a bit um but uh the elect that word means something kind of specific here uh i mean i think theologically there's like a lot of stuff going on with it too but uh politically in the sense uh the elect is a reference to like an actual sort of political group that is uh i don't know somehow operative in the peasants war called the league of the elect um oh right (laughs) which is like uh kind of funny league of the elect sounds like a superhero group like a superhero band but uh superhero band made of uh democrats <laughs> yeah that's right uh lutheran democrats um <laughs> but anyways that's what that there's like something going on there just want to note that yeah um <laughs> sort of a, a side note to that side note um Ooh, two sides side away notes. from our regular conversation oh my gosh uh <laughs> um angles has a lot to say about that uh but my favorite thing is that he describes the league of the elect as a um like a political party uh in fact uh i'll just like read this quick bit from his uh book on the peasants war he says um the uh the difference was that while luther confined himself to an expression of the ideas and wishes of a majority of his class and thereby acquired among it a very cheap popularity mozart on the contrary went far beyond the immediate ideas and demands of the plebeians and peasants organizing out of the then existing revolutionary elements a party which as far as it stood on the level of his ideas and shared his energy still represented only a minority of the insurgent masses uh so basically like mozart is the first vanguardist i think is the the subtext here sure how it seems to me (laughs) 
I mean, I don't know if that's like a good reading, but it's a fun reading. It's a strong reading. Historians get at us. It. Yeah, I don't know. It's cool though. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, back to uh, two sides. Two sides back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, following right along with what Deedon said earlier about violence, um, Munster is ready to throw down, which is not surprising, sort of given the larger context and sort of like where Munster's theology places him in that context. So Munster says, whosoever does evil to one of these little ones is better for him that a millstone be hung about his neck and that he is thrown to the depths of the sea. Now, if Christ can say this about someone who does evil to one of the little ones, what should be said about those who do evil to a great multitude in their faith? For this is how arch villains act, who do evil to the world and make it deviate from the true Christian faith and who say that no one shall know the mysteries of God. Um, so getting, getting really hard into that, um, that sort of justification for violence. Uh, if Christ says that, like, you know, if you lead the little ones astray, this thing should happen to you. Um, which is kind of pretty, pretty rough. Something like, I guess that pacifists struggle with and, uh, even I struggle with cause it's kind of, kind of rough. But anyways, uh, if you do great evil, not to just one of these little ones, but like everybody, um, that's how arch villains act. Yeah, I mean, this is especially appropriate for the conversation about taking kids away from their families, right? Because uh, causing little ones to stumble, um, I mean, that's exactly what Christ says is the, uh, like, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck, right? Um, like, it's almost like you'd, it, it would be better if like you hadn't even been born in a certain way, right. is uh, the way that some commentators have read that before. Uh, I think there's really something about that that should stop uh, stop those people in their tracks. Um, but obviously it doesn't. Like, it doesn't even register. Um, and what Munzer is saying is, like, if Jesus is willing to say that about what happens to, like, children, then imagine what Jesus might say about what happens to, like, the majority of even other Christians. Uh, that's exactly what sort of lords and princes are doing uh, in Germany and certainly... Uh, yeah, I think even on a even on a greater scale than Munster could have imagined what uh, people are doing today in the name of Christianity in the United States and around the world. Yeah, I mean, I know throughout this entire thing, I'm talking about how great the rhetoric is or how interesting the rhetoric is, at least, and how like sophisticated it is. Uh, but uh, at the end of it all, we can kind of conclude that it didn't work. Like he didn't persuade the princes to act differently. He didn't. He didn't persuade the the aristocrats to sort of contribute their military force to the side of the peasants. Because uh, if he had, then they would have won, or I mean, they would have had a better shot, <laughs> I guess. Right. Um. So I, I guess what's what's like kind of wild about this to me, and in the context of the um the immigration situation, is that like uh persuading the princes doesn't work because they don't have a conscience in the first place. Like they're unaffected by this for some like deeper reason. Uh, before we started talking, Dean, uh, you were telling me about the response that the uh, American bishops had to the um, children, like the forcible separation mm-hmm. of children. Um, what was the term they used? It was a good one. Yeah, so Cardinal uh, Tobin in New Jersey, uh, he described the policy as a consistent with cardiosclerosis, um, so like a hardening of uh, the heart in America. Right. Um, I think that's like such an apt term and I, obviously playing out in both places. Uh, the rich and powerful don't really care about like what the peasants, like what the um, lower class, what the displaced um, are going through for, you know, reasons. Yeah. I think too, that helps frame some of the problems with a certain kind of Christian uh, liberalism which basically appeals to like the conscience of other Americans and elected representatives, et cetera. Uh, so the assumption is you could just say like, don't you see how terrible this is, right? Like you share a Facebook photo or a Facebook article. Um, and it's like, how can anybody believe this? And you sort of hope that in doing that, like you'll prick somebody's conscience or their reason to sort of naturally be like, you're right. Like I didn't even know. So it's a problem of ignorance or something like that. Um, but I think like, we like we know that that's not really why people think the way that they think or why they make certain decisions and it's definitely not why people in power think what they think uh so i don't know like 
what I love about Munster is that he actually tries to kind of make this appeal to conscience. Uh, but when it fails, he doesn't just like keep throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it sticks. Like he builds a movement, yeah. uh, builds a party, yeah. um, invests in like revolutionary energies. And I think that like, that's the kind of thing that American Christians hopefully could sort of start maybe imagining or thinking about. Like, I'm not calling for like an all out peasants war in the United States, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like, I don't know, go like do something else. Like don't write another letter to your representative, but like show up at like a union meeting or something, you know, Uh, like that's where the energy actually exists. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's a really, uh, I mean, get organized is always a good, (laughs) a good message uh, at the, at the bottom of our podcast here. Um, It, this is kind of like out of left field, but it does remind me of this thing that uh, Gilles Deleuze said one time uh, in this one essay it's called Capitalism, A Very Special Delirium, uh, which is a good title. But Deleuze is this whole thing about how, like, um, societies, uh, capitalist societies are, like, simultaneously rational and irrational. Like, they're rational is so insofar as you, like, kind of accept the, like, basic terms. Uh, but, like, if you kind of look at it from, uh, well, I mean, Deleuze is a special case. But in our case, if you look at it some sort of from, like, this, like, Marxist paradigm, you see the sort of irrationality of it all. Like, um, of course, like Jeff Sessions thinks that there should be a zero tolerance policy because he's like some kind of like strange ideologue who thinks that like borders exist, right? Like it's like this really actually irrational idea. It keeps people from sort of understanding uh, and empathizing with people who are like actually being, I don't know, hurt and killed and displaced by these like policies that they're creating. Yeah, for sure. Um. Well, maybe we should uh like go to sort of the the conclusion of this sermon to the princes, which brings out Munzer's full, <laughs> um, full uh revolutionary energies, uh, revolutionary rhetoric, um, for better or worse, uh, and then uh, we'll kind of move on a little bit more to the um, confession side of it. So he um he ends on this note where he does all these like pretty weird exegetical readings or like exegetical allusions at least to different biblical texts trying to argue that like violence is is justified and even called for um some of that hermeneutical ground is pretty shaky <laughs> but, but it's weird nevertheless because he is, it's weird because he is such a good like reader i think like yeah throughout the entire sermon he's got like references and like i think is making some pretty good use of the texts but there are some places where it's like well maybe not <laughs> yeah and i mean like uh in fairness to him like this is pretty common practice uh especially in like medieval and then in early modern uh christian hermeneutics like they don't have the same hang-ups about um like getting things exactly right that we have today mm-hmm. uh so whatever that's just the convention of the time um but i kind of like it as uh maybe he's sort of ironically realizing luther's uh advice to like sin boldly like he's just giving like the wrong reading on purpose in a way um but anyway, he, he concludes saying, without a doubt, many untested people will be angered by this booklet, because I say with Christ, with Paul, and with the instruction of the whole divine law, that godless rulers, especially the priests and monks, should be killed. They tell us the holy gospel is a heresy, and at the same time, they want to be the best Christians. Uh, and I think that, I mean, obviously brings sort of the full force home of um, Munzer's ideas, uh, but it would be wrong to read Munzer as like frothing at the mouth for violence, I think at the same time. Um, and we'll see a little bit more of that in the confessions here, but I think it's important to sort of end on that note that like Munzer is, he's giving this call to the princes or whatever. Um, but this just maybe reinforces what we were just saying that at the end of the day, like he knows that they're not going to listen. Um, and he says, you know, people are going to get pissed and uh, they're going to get pissed specifically because Munzer thinks that he's sort of in this lineage of Christ and Paul and other people who uh, made people upset. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was right that he did get a bunch of people pissed. And uh, like we said earlier, he was murdered for it. So at one point he gets captured during the the, uh, peasants war and he's killed and later he's beheaded and, um, or I don't know, maybe it was killed by beheading. It's not clear to me. But in any case, his head was removed from his body and, uh, <laughs> at one point. And uses a deterrent for others. So it was kind of put on a stick and like presented even. Yikes. Yeah. Um, super yikes. Uh, but before they did that, uh, they did extract a bunch of confessions out of him. And they say, I don't know exactly like who wrote this document, but it's included in the text. 
Um, so they they divide it up into some voluntary confessions and then some confessions under torture. And uh, what I think is really interesting about this document is that it's a propagandist text. So, you know, it's meant to kind of be like, look at how bad this guy is. Um, but if you're a revolutionary Christian, it's actually very cool. <laughs> um, so you kind of have to take some of it with a grain of salt, I guess, uh, because you don't really know the, the truth of it. Um, but I think that you, you get a kind of strangely fuller picture of what Munzer thought about violence in particular and uh, about the, the kind of program. So we pulled out just like a few things from the confessions. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Matt, to pull out a couple from, from the voluntary side first, maybe. Yeah. So voluntarily, he reports. <laughs> um, okay, he said, uh, th- this is what they report of Munzer. He says that Lord's castles are very onerous and overloaded with services and other burdens on the subjects. The reason that he accused and reviled the gracious Lord, territorial prince, and count Ernst of Mansfield was that Count Ernst's subjects complained that the word of God was not being preached to them. It was forbidden to them, and they were not permitted to hear it. Munzer commanded them all to denounce their superiors. If the word of God was not being preached to them, he said, that they should then come to him. He wanted to preach it to them himself, and they should not let themselves be prevented from hearing it by anyone. So this is uh, pretty wild, actually. Um, <laughs> that that the Lord's castles are very onerous and overload the services is like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess like that's kind of like what everyone is working for in a feudal society, like sort of in the feudal system, like everyone is like basically sort of serving those feudal lords, anyways. Um, and uh, that 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 he thinks, and that probably all of the other sort of like uh, peasants think that they are onerous and overloaded is not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I I do love that it points out a specific lord, Ernst of Mansfield. Yeah, <laughs> that he's a he's the gracious lord uh, that is specifically annoying and uh, preventing his um, peasants from hearing the gospel. Um, that's such a great complaint that the peasants are like, "Hey, nobody's letting us listen to the gospel." Uh, presumably, that's because the peasants who are being permitted to hear the gospel are hearing it from people like Munzer and other uh, yeah. people involved in the peasants' uprising, Yeah, uh, where it turns out the gospel means that you shouldn't like your lord very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, well, what's the next confession? <laughs> yeah, so here's some stuff. Uh, he apparently confessed under torture. Um, so one is, uh, he confesses that if he had conquered the castle of Helndringen, as he and all his followers had intended, he would have beheaded Count Ernst, as indeed he often publicly announced. So I guess they had to uh, torture him to uh, make sure that all that public announcement was true. Um, so then uh, it goes on to say, he undertook the rebellion so that the people of Christendom would all be equal, and so that the princes and lords who did want, who, who did not want to support the gospel and who refused to accept the League after being admonished to do so in a friendly way would be banished or executed. And uh, the last one to pull out here is, uh, it was their article of belief, the Munzer and his sort of co-conspirators, uh, and they wanted to establish this principle that all property should be held in common, omnia sunt communia, and should be distributed to each according to his need as the occasion required. Any prince, count, or lord who did not want to do this after first being warned about it should be beheaded or hanged. Listen, uh, you don't have to torture me to say that. <laughs> a lot going on here um <laughs> a lot a lot lot going on uh i think one thing though that i like is that uh under torture he actually kind of like qualifies some of these uh calls for violence yeah like it, like he doesn't want to go kill all these lords or whatever it's like well listen here's what we're gonna do do you want to do that or not <laughs> it's like uh i don't want to do that okay then like sorry you can't be here like however you want to do it like you can go away or we can make you go away. friendly like, friendly this admonishment. Is what's happening <laughs> yeah for friendly admonishment uh i mean there's just something about that that i find kind of endearing in a way that it's like yeah uh hey we're here so like you get to choose one last time uh what's it gonna be <laughs> yeah um i like that it's pretty good it's a really nice, a really friendly, a friendly revolution. <laughs> yeah, uh, somewhat friendly. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, I think it's also fascinating because that kind of uh, rhetoric of violence is really off-putting for a lot of people, especially Christians. 
Um, actually, this sort of takes me back to, I, w- I went to a Mennonite church for a little while, and uh, I remember talking with a bunch of people there, and they were all about, you know, Menno, Menno Simmons and mm-hmm. other Mennonites. Uh, and they they were, like, pretty down with property sharing and things like that. They weren't communists, but they were, like, open to that. Uh, but they would always, like, mention Thomas Munzer as kind of an embarrassing, like, moment in the history of Anabaptism. Right. And uh, I, was, I was like, what? Why? Like, he was extremely cool. Uh, but that kind of nonviolence stopped them from, I guess, seeing Munzer as one of their own. Like, he's sort of, a, a, a like, an embarrassing um, child uh, who sort of left the fold or something. Right. Um, but I think, like, this actually clarifies some of the uh, willingness he has to talk about violence in a way. Yeah. Uh, some of the other confessions are, uh, I mean, I guess to us at least, extremely funny. Um, they're kind of like, they kind of read like really lame, uh, like theological attack ads, like political attack ads. <laughs> Did you know that Munzer does not want the holy, most worthy sacrament of communion to be outwardly adored, but only regarded in a spiritual way? However, he says it's a matter for personal judgment. <laughs> <laughs> He says that he gave the sacrament to the sick and himself partook in the afternoon after he ate at midday, but also that he took the sacrament at night at every opportunity. He took ordinary bread and wine and consecrated them. Can you believe this guy? Paid for by friends of Count Ernst. (laughs) Munzer says that princes should only ride with eight horses, a count with four, and a nobleman with two, and not more. (laughs) <laughs> extremely generous <laughs> like stop riding so many goddamn horses how about that <laughs> how about have less horses that's like what a how revolutionary like, claim uh, yeah how about not have more than eight horses please <laughs> just less just less horses <laughs> nine horses too many eight though perfect that is the that is the <laughs> amount of horses uh, that is uh, befitting princes, I would say. <laughs> a count they can do with four. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think uh, what's so good about Munzer really is that um, he just provides maybe one more resource in the like toolkit of Christians today to be thinking about all this stuff. Like, you know, one reason that we have been kind of doing some historical episodes. Uh, just here and there to kind of fill the gaps so we don't have guests is not just to not just because like we're academics who like read books or something like that um but i think more so because there's something in the history of christian radicalism that is important to not lose um again not to establish like a true christianity but definitely to establish like a revolutionary tradition within christianity um, like, I think there are a lot of Christian leftists today who feel alienated from Christianity and maybe feel like, uh, maybe struggle with the idea that having these kind of leftist sympathies are somehow aberrant or just like too weird. There are at least a lot of conservative Christians who are willing to say that. Um, but the history of Christianity proves otherwise. And I think it's helpful to kind of like think back on, you know, how Munzer spoke the truth, not just to power, um, but, like, spoke the truth to the masses as well and uh, tried to, like, organize them in such a way that they were actually a threat that could deliver um, rather than just a threat that could be, like, made and then, like, you get arrested for it at the U.S. Capitol and then you, like, get out of jail and then you, like, go talk again and get arrested for that and sort of, like, repeat that cycle forever. (laughs) Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, kind of thinking back to that Christians for Socialism thing as, like, um, as so often, like, I think that as leftist Christians feel like as Christians without churches and communists without parties, um, like it's just, it's great to have sort of a moment or, or like a regime of people you can kind of recall to think of yourself as like kind of a part of, um, especially in the United States where we are like really disconnected from one another. And like, we only kind of exist communally on Twitter. It's just good to kind of like have that history of like a place to think yourself in between of. Yeah, totally. Um, And even more than that, like in the Christians for Socialism organizing group here in Toronto, uh, like we've been reading some of uh, Gustavo Gutierrez lately. And it's nice to read that kind of stuff because like that book is pretty old now, Theology of Liberation, um, but it still speaks a lot. And uh, it's like comforting to know that there were other Christians who feel this way or feel upset and thought really hard about how to change things. Uh, and so even beyond like Twitter, like it's like when you get a bunch of Christians in a room, 
uh, and they start talking about like injustice in their world uh, and learning about Christians who actually did something about it, like that helps to encourage a certain kind of revolutionary imagination that I think is sort of been lost among Christians that they've been a little too cowardly to think about it in North America. Yeah, for sure. It's also um, nice too to have a little bit of a language to uh, condemn bad Christians with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that maybe that's like, thing. maybe that's like a stupid thing, but like, it's good to have sort of a descriptive and rhetorically powerful language to kind of employ against people that are bad. For sure. No, it is. Uh, and, and Christians shouldn't be afraid to do it either in like some kind of uh, like value of conciliatory rhetoric or something like that. Like Christianity and uh, like, you know, the Old Testament prophets and that, like they stand in a pretty long history of like, you know, sending insults toward the people that actually deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, well, speaking speaking of those insults, um, there's a pretty good uh, a, a pretty good turn of uh, phrase in the Sermon to the Princes, and I'm going to give you, Matt, the honor of reading it if you want. Thank you. I do want that honor. Okay, so at the, the end of Sermon to the Princes, Munster sort of sums it all up saying this, uh, sort of like a, a really inspiring note to end on. Rejoice, ye true friends of God, that the enemies of the cross have crapped their courage into their pants. <laughs> that's what it says that's what, actually what it says so so, so that's that's uh in our in our uh r- radical christian recall rejoice you t- <laughs> rejoice you true friends of god that the enemies of the cross have crapped their courage into their pants they act righteously even though they never once dreamed of doing so why should we recoil before vacillating incapable men only be bold he to whom is given all power in heaven and earth, Christ, wants to lead the government. To you, most beloved, may God grant eternal protection. It's a pretty good benediction. It is. A real crappy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Uh, it's been fun to kind of think through Munzer and also challenging to relate it a little bit, but hopefully this sparks a conversation and it'd be great to hear more. Um, I mean, if people are kind of listening to uh, these podcasts, especially about like Munzer and Stanley and others, um, and something strikes you, like tweet it out. Like it's really good to kind of get those conversations going, I think, on Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere, just trying to build these uh, this imagination together of revolutionary Christianity. Um, so send us your ideas. Uh, also, if you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, it's really cool that so many people do. It blows our minds uh, every month that <laughs> there are people who want to support the labor that goes into making a podcast like this. And uh, it's really, really nice of you. Um, you can also, if you don't have money laying around, but you still want to help us out, uh, you can give us a review on iTunes that is surprisingly more helpful than you'd think. Um, it keeps us sort of in the algorithmic flow or uh, however you want to put it. Um, but basically it just keeps us on people's radar. So that's really helpful. Um, you can also find us all over the internet. We're on Twitter at the Magnificast. We're on Facebook at the Magnificast. Uh, we've got a Facebook group called the Magnificast Basement. i um, been sharing some stuff about the uh, DPRK there and Christians who live there. So go chat about that, I guess. Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, we, uh, we're on two podcast networks. So we're on Critical Mediations. There's a bunch of other good folks on there, like Revolutionary Left Radio and Season of the Bitch and plenty more. Uh, we're also on Theology Corner, where you can find us and a ton of other really fun kind of offbeat Christian podcasts, including our good friend Catherine at Friendly Anarchism, who we just like never tire of supporting. Um, she's super great. Uh, if you're not following her on everything <laughs> social media wise, uh, you should start. I don't think I've said this on the podcast, but uh, Kat- Catherine sent us this giant like uh, ma- like package full of like... Uh friendly anarchism pins and glitter which was fun and googly eyes <laughs> and also uh she put these like uh I-, I guess they're like back patches for like our cool punk jackets and uh man if i was 17 and i still had a cool punk jacket i would be all about this but uh for now it's just gonna kind of sit on my desk and i'm gonna look at it and think wow what a cool thing <laughs> i might get a cool punk jacket actually yeah just to have a place to put this patch 
Dang, I need to get some like those little like uh, study metal study guys from Hot Topic. <laughs> That's right. Um, it is extremely good though, and uh, Catherine's super nice. And in addition to all that, like she is way more sort of activist heavy, I think, in her podcast than we are, which is really fun um and in important work uh she was just in montreal talking to a bunch of anarchists about spirituality so you know she's out there doing the dang thing so uh help her do it um anyway yeah uh as always the music in the podcast has been by uh, amori armstrong couple time guest on the podcast and the outro is from the illogical spoon thanks and we'll see you next week I don't want to get up at church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late.